So today we are going to be making mead. But I thought that we would start by acknowledging the country that we're filming on today, which is the Jara people's country and the language spoken here um, was and still is and hopefully will be for a very long time is Jajawarong. And I'd like to pay my respects to the ancestors of the people who have lived and who are still living on this land and I would like to pay my respects to the ancestors of the trees, the ancestors of the pollinators and the ancestors of the water and the mountains and the microbes that are going to be present and helping us um, today that we have co-evolved with for thousands of years and that we have been co-evolving with over the last uh, just over a decade on this land here. Um, so I thought that we would also start by introducing you to our bees and although the bees like us are newcomer species they too have ancestors and I would like to acknowledge the ancestors of our European bees and our ancestors as well, mine and Patrick. Um, so let's go chat to our bees. So you can see here we've got two Warre hives next to each other and here is a Dalesford top bar hive and so in the springtime we're hoping to catch a swarm. So you can see it's quite a cold day today and they're still gathering outside. There's quite a bit of activity. I don't know what the temperature is, maybe 12, 12 degrees. Okay, so there you go. So in some cultures there was a tradition of, it's called telling the bees. And usually it was when uh, big things would happen, when someone was born or someone would die or people get married or people going away on trips, you would come and tell your bees because if you, the bees are very sensitive and the thought thinking was that if you didn't tell the bees then they would know that something was wrong and they weren't exactly sure why so you had to tell them so they would be informed just to keep the colony happy. So although it's not such a big thing that we're making mead today, I thought that I would come and tell the bees that we are making mead from your honey and we will honour that mead and we will honour honor the gifts that you b continually bestow on us, whether it's our pollinating vegetables that we eat and also telling the kookaburras, we're making mead! Mead! <laughs> Let's go make mead. So for those of you who don't know, mead is an alcoholic beverage made from honey and water. You can make it in lots of different complicated experimental ways and I have done a lot of that. But today I'm gonna to be showing you a very, very basic ferment with just honey and water. So it has been said that mead was one of the first alcoholic beverages ever made when some rain got into a wild hive and the um, water interacted with the honey, interacted with the wild microbes and voila, we had this delicious mead. And um, here in Australia, we, um, it's also been said that cider gum sap um, has interacted with some rain and that was probably the first um, alcoholic beverage that was made here. So to start with, we're going to have a little talk about the vessels that we're going to put our honey and our water in. So we have a whole bunch of these um, fermenting vessels that we bought online. Um, we've, we have found that if you make alcohol in um, a vessel with an airlock at the top, then there's little chance that it will turn to vinegar because we have a fermenting table with alcohols and vinegars fermenting next to each other. Then this is a way that the carbon dioxide as it ferments can be released and no oxygen can get in um, with the vinegar. So there's no vinegar molecules in it to turn the liquid into vinegar. So if you don't have one of these vessels that are around $30 online, um, you can just make it in a jar. So I do have over here, 
And this is one that I made out of leatherwood honey. Um, our friend Brenna, who runs our local seed library, gave us some leatherwood honey. And so I made a little jar of this. And when we can see each other again and celebrate, Brenna, I will be drinking this with you. So we have our vessel. Before I do any fermenting, I wash my vessels in very hot soapy water. Um, I don't use any sterilizing agents because we don't need to. It doesn't need to be sterile. We are courting life and we are courting microbes um, and various yeasts, um, especially the ones present in the honey. So I'm just going to keep this washed as is. And next I'm going to add my honey in. Now, just a note about honeys. Uh, you've met our bees and they have met you. Um, so we use, when we extract the honey, we don't crush it, we don't spin it. It is cold extracted and we, uh, we um, put it in a fabric sieve, like, like a fabric funnel, and then we just drip it out. So it, you just have to be very careful when you're making meads. You don't want heat extracted honey because when it's heated, it's heated to such temperatures that medicinal qualities of the honey are no longer present. Um, best to get local honey honey that is local to your bioregion so where you where you're living and often that's got the properties of the pollens and it's just much better to be part of your environment where you're living so how much honey should you use i like to use one part honey and three parts water so and you don't fill the water up to the top you need to leave a bit of air and that's called headroom so in this vessel here which is four liters, is that right? Four or five liters. Um, so I'm gonna put the liquid up to here. So here I'm gonna say about a quarter. I'm gonna mark this here. I'm just gonna do honey up to here. Okay, so now I'm going to fill the vessel up to my line. Isn't that beautiful? I'm going to fill my vessel now with water up to the top here. Water is a gift from the rainy goddess. We must water all her seeds of joy. For without her, we are really captured. Know this metaphor. Maybe just a bit more. You don't feel anything. Okay. So if you have access to rainwater and the rainwater in your area is drinkable, I would definitely go with that. Uh, if you are on uh, town water and your town water is drinkable, then I would go with that. Uh, if your town water is full of chemicals like chlorine and when you uh, turn the tap on you really smell that off-gassing, I would put it in a jar just by itself or a bowl or something and just let that off-gas for 15 minutes or you could boil it um, or just put it in a jar and let some UV light, so let the, um, the sun shine onto it. Um, and maybe wait 24 hours or you, you know the water in your local area. I would just use the best rainwater that you can. It's so pretty. Can you see all the bubbles in it? Now we're going to stir it all in. Uh, so in terms of the stick that you can use, uh, traditionally it was the woman of the house who carried a magic mead stick in her robes around with her at all times. And it was thought that it was the stick that was used that actually created the mead, the mixing of the honey and the water. And in actual fact, it was partly because that stick was never washed and it held all the microbes that was transferring all of the previous batch. So like inoculating the current batch with the, um, the, micro, the wild microbes from the previous batch. Uh, so I'm going to be using this wooden fork that Patrick and Woody made me. Okay, I'm just gonna stir it in, wow. So 
so you can use any stick you like. Last time I made mead, Patrick was doing the pruning and he had some uh, mulberry, mulberry twigs, so I just used a mulberry twig. Um, you can use a wooden spoon, you can use any long spoon that you've got. Or if you're going to do it in a jar, you can just use a short spoon, if you're using a short jar. <laughs> so we're going to stir this every day, twice a day, for two weeks. So if you have to set yourself a reminder in a phone or something, or ask your child who might have a better memory than you to remind you, or maybe stick it somewhere where you're going to remember, to stir it every day. Maybe do it when you brush your teeth as well, so you'll remember. So every day, twice a day, for two weeks. And really trying to stir in those wild yeasts and the wild microbes, because it is, we're trying to aerate it. So it is an aerobic fermentation. So it needs the air in it. Wow, it's, can you see all the little, like little hairs in there? So you could put uh, a little bit of warm water in there if you wanted to make it easier. I don't necessarily want to make it easier. I want to be in touch with every step of this process. <laughs> if you were going to make this in summer, it would certainly be easier. But here we are, tail end of autumn, making it. So as I mentioned, this is a six month ferment. So if you put it on soon, it will be ready for summer solstice or winter solstice, if you are in the Northern Hemisphere. And so when you stir it, really try to without spilling and this is one reason why we leave the headroom and another reason is because as it really starts to ferment it'll start to bubble like in the next week or so to 10 days every time I do this it'll froth and the froth will rise and you don't want it to spill over you don't want to waste a drop so you can stir it any direction you like and then I like to go the other way to introduce a bit of chaos theory into it. And I'm sure people who practice biodynamic techniques have already got a really wonderful way that they do their stirring. But you can stir however way makes sense for you. hissing crackling sounds so when your liquid is still that's when you put your lid on I mean it doesn't really matter for this because the carbon dioxide will just be released but if you are making it in a jar you can now when it's the water the liquid is still that's when you put your lid on it uh, you can for the first two weeks also do an open ferment so you can just leave it like this and maybe put a cloth and a rubber band or just a cloth on it um, for the first two weeks and then when it's finished fermenting that's when you put your lid on it and you can of course put the lid on and just shake it I've made it in a jar several times and I don't like to do that it just feels disconnected it just feels a bit rough just to put the lid on and shake it I really like the idea of using an implement and being involved much more much more involved in the stirring of it and if you are going to be making it in a jar, then you will have to burp it, which in fermenting language means just open the, the uh, lid a little bit and let some of the carbon dioxide out because it will continue to off gas to ferment. Um, so now that that's still, I'm gonna put my uh, lid on it and I'm just gonna uh, fill this uh, up with some water. Anyway, I can put a bit more of that uh, a bit later. So there we go. That is the first part of our mead ferment. And I'm going to stir it again this afternoon and twice a day for the next two weeks. And then I'm going to set it aside for six months. And that is it. 
That is all you have to do and then in six months it will be ready. Uh, please remember to stir it every day for the first two weeks. I've had friends who thought, oh, well, I don't need to and it didn't work. It went off, it went mouldy. Um, so the first two weeks to really, really get in there and be part of the process and you can have an intention in your mind or in your heart as you're stirring it, that part is optional. The term honeymoon actually relates to mead that the, the newlyweds were given mead to drink for every night uh, for a whole lunar cycle after, their, um, after they were married and that was meant to increase their fertility. So I always like that story. So after the six months and your mead is ready, you can just decant it and drink it as is and it is absolutely delicious. What I like to do is to drink some of it plain and to do some second ferments, some secondary ferments. Um, so put some flavors into it after that. So I've just got some empty jars or bottles here and I've got, this is a mead that I made um, August the 3rd last year and you can see that was the line where I filled the honey to. So I'm just going to decant this. Oh, it smells so good. So this one here, I'm going to put in some medlars. Uh, medlars are uh, fruit that's in the apple and the rose family and they're in season in autumn here and absolutely delicious. So I'm just going to put those whole fruit in. You can mash them. Uh, I like what Sandor Cat says about putting fruit in um, in your melamel, which is your fruit um, infused mead um, and that is that you also want the essence of the fruit not just the flavor and the the vitamins from them so I'm going to put that aside and this one here I'm going to make it a bit more medicinal and I'm going to put some um, mountain pepper in and this mountain pepper was gifted to us by Tim and Mariah from um, Braidwood so thank you to those guys and this is some turmeric from um, um, grown by Cyrano and Bianca in the Northern Rivers. So this, I'm actually just going to chop one just to show you how beautiful that is. But again, I'm just going to put this in here. So for those of you who don't know, curcumin, the active ingredient in turmeric, so the curcumin can be bioavailable, which means so it can be more readily ingested and absorbed into your body. Um, it has to be taken one of three ways, with some pepper, with a fat as a carrier, or fermented. So here, we're going to leave the turmeric in there for maybe 10 days, so it probably won't have a chance to uh, properly ferment. So we do have it with the black pepper just to ensure that. And so another thing that I like to do, I like to write two different dates on here. So this is August the 3rd, 19, which is when the mead was made. And then today's date is... <laughs> I've got no idea. Oh. Sometime in June. Is it June already? No, it's May. Oh. May yeah. 20. Oh, oh, yeah, maybe 22nd of May, that's right. Is it? Okay. Yeah. And then I'm going to put May the 22nd. 20. So I like to put those on just so I know exactly what it is and I know that's when it was made, that's when the um, second ferments were added and then the same for this one. Okay so last time I made a mead I made it exactly how I showed you today and I did put some in a jar and I put a cloth over it and I thought I'm just going to stir this for the first two weeks and leave it with the cloth over the top and see what happens and of course it turned to vinegar and it is a very delicious sweet vinegar um, so I've made this is uh, mistress mead so this is a medicinal uh, vinegar so it's got in it some um, rose hips and a little bit of ginger some mountain pepper and some chili. So I did make this for you, Patrick. Mm, thanks, Mila. My heart is pounding. Oh my god. Wow. Very chili ish. Chili y. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look it. Wow. Oh, yeah. And so. There you go. So we have our 
Wow. That's Ferment. Really oh, I haven't written today's date on this one. Oh, naughty. Mm. So is it definitely May the 22nd? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to write today's date on it. And make sure that you do put the date on it because you think to yourself, I'll remember that day, that beautiful day that the sun was shining <laughs> and we were scrambling under the net to eat the meddlers. But you will forget. Okay, so we have our mead that we have stirred once and I'm going to stir it again this afternoon and every day for the next two weeks, twice a day, and then leave it to ferment for six months. We have our six months old or longer actually, they're from August to so September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. Nine month old um, meads with some secondary ferments in them and we have our vinegar mead. Now also if you are interested in fermenting um, liquids especially and drinks, I've got, uh, we've got the Wild Crafting Brewer which is a really fantastic book and also the Sacred and Herbal Healing Beers. Uh, the secret the secrets of ancient fermentation both really wonderful for very different reasons um yeah yeah if you do have any questions or comments just leave them below as questions for us um apologies if you have sent us messages or emails we've been a little bit overwhelmed so we are trying to get through to everybody's questions so um thank you in advance for your patience yeah so that is how you make mead may you go forth and enjoy it and make mead like a true neo-peasant and of course i don't want to say drink responsibly um but it's also in the making that is making it thoughtfully and with great consideration about where all of your inputs come from and to honor the bees with every sip of what you make um and yeah to to cult if i think it's really healthy to cultivate a healthful um, relationship with alcohol if that is what you are going to be drinking um, and to do it with reverence for everything that has gone into the making of it whether it's the reverence for the clouds and the rainfall um, for the water and of course the bees for their gifts of honey and their gifts of pollination um, and the sunshine and the wild microbes that make our life possible so thanks everybody, enjoy.